Hello, welcome back. I'm Chaya, and I'm the COO and uh, events director at Future Music Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I am here to introduce the uh, music tech demonstrations. Um, so ever since music went digital, there's been an explosion of online platforms and widgets to make life easier for musicians. Many of the early tools were aimed at simply getting music to fans, but now we're seeing the proliferation of services that aim to assist artists with everything from money management to touring to websites to fan communications and e-commerce. Today we'll explore a handful of those services and get some instant feedback from our panel of experts who will each be giving a five minute presentation and then we'll hear from our panel of reactors who are also going to sit in the front row and then we'll move on to the next presentation. So please join me in welcoming our four um, presentations by Chris McDonald, CEO and co-founder of Huge Fan. Um, sorry, no, I'm just gonna run through the names first. You're fine. Uh, Brooke Parrott, uh, artist ambassador um, from Songkick and also of Lac Le Monde. Thank you. Matt Ermey, co-founder and CEO of Artist Growth. Jesse Von Doom, co-executive director of Cash Music. And I will let Brian Calhoun, our moderator, introduce our reaction panel. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a very exciting panel to me. This is one of the coolest things uh, on a regular basis, I, uh, in my role at the Blueprint Group, which is an artist management company, we talk with, uh, uh, we talk with technology companies and uh, businesses that are trying to do business with the artists and labels that we represent. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. We did this last year and had a, had a really good time. But kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, this is what we do. We, we get presentations, and then we grill the people who are making the presentations and try to determine why or why not uh, our artists should use the platform. So what I'm going to do just real quickly is ask my um, reaction panelists to introduce themselves. And then, uh, as Chai said, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and do the presentations. Uh, each one will have uh, five minutes, and then there'll be 10 minutes of Q&A from the reaction panelists. So um, I think what, what I'll, I'll bring the microphone down to you guys, and you can introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I'm Will Eastman. I'm a DJ and music producer based here in Washington, DC. I'm also one third of the group Volta Bureau and owner of U Street Music Hall, a small underground venue on U Street. 500 capacity. Hi, my name is Emily White. I run a management and consulting company called Whitesmith Entertainment. We manage musicians, comedians, and an athlete, and are based in New York and Los Angeles. And I also run a label, publishing, and film company called Ready Made Records with Brendan Benson. Hello, my name is Gerald Miller. I own a record label, New Jazz Entertainment, that's distributed through uh, Universal Music Group. And uh, we have a number of National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Masters, like three out of the five Marcellus family. And through the management company, New Jazz Management, we've managed artists like uh, Lauren Hill, uh, a few of the Marcelluses, about 20 other artists. So, All right. Um, and I was also asked to mention that, unfortunately, Chad Clark couldn't be here because uh, he's ill. So uh, our thoughts are with him to get better. And uh, I think with that, we'll go ahead and get things started with... Uh, oh. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I, I'm a board member on Cash Music, um, but I was saying in the green room, I think one reason why Jesse wanted me on the board um, of Cash as a manager is if it doesn't make sense to me, it's not going to make sense, you know, to anyone. So um, anyway, I'll try to be as not biased as possible. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, my group, Volta Bureau, uh, was featured in the launch video for Huge Fan. <laughs> I'm actually apparently the only one not in conflict with anybody. So. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. And um, I guess let's go ahead and get things started with uh, Artist Growth. Okay. This, this is the mover? I'm guessing? Okay. Okay, so 
Uh, artist growth has been around f since January of this year. So we're very young uh, in terms of our platform and our technology is very new and it's something that uh, we build very quickly. Uh, my background is as a touring artist. Uh, my co-founder's background is as a touring artist. And the reason that we started uh, thinking about building a tool like this was because we, of all the services that were emerging over the last you know, several years, what we didn't have was something to help us keep track of the small day-to-day -day logistics uh, when you're out there on the road. So whether that's taking pictures of receipts and storing them in the cloud or communicating with promoters, radio and publicists, et cetera, people that we were working with. So uh, we set out to build a platform. Um, uh, and the one thing we knew uh, when we thought about uh, building a platform, since none of our backgrounds were in technology, none of us were programmers or, or software developers, um, was that we knew we wanted it to be mobile and we knew we wanted it to scale it from a phone out to the web and not try to do it the other way around. Um, and this slide is sort of, a, you know, I call it the myth, this is sort of what really prompted us into actually going into development and raising money to build a product was this idea that if you're an artist that now that there are e-commerce tools out there and there's digital distribution and these sorts of things, that you now have everything you need in order to have a successful career in the music industry. Um, while that's potentially true, uh, I think the axiom applies that if you give a small child a bucket of blocks, they aren't going to build the Empire State Building. They're going to build something that's going to fall over really quickly. So the idea is that they don't know how to use the tools. Uh, there are certain protocols in any industry. Um, there are certain ways you do things from sales to uh, accounting and finances. I didn't have these expertise. I didn't. I studied poetry in college. I didn't study, uh, you know, finance and accounting. So, we were frustrated with this idea that, oh, we've given you everything you need. Now go make your career. Direct a fan. Um, even though all of those tools are wonderful, and I'm friends with the guys who build those tools. Um, so we were looking at it, and we thought, well, music content technology has exploded, but there hasn't been a whole lot of business technology. There hasn't been a whole lot of back end management stuff built for artists to learn how to use the forward-facing uh, commerce tools and marketing tools and distribution tools um, so they can actually make wise decisions, learn about sales, learn about these things. Um, so we wanted to build something that was not just focused on content but business. Um, and this, this slide is just to kind of give you an idea of where I was coming from when I designed this platform. And, and this, you know, the word paradigm has been used a lot in this industry, this shift, this, this movement from uh, you know, a closed industry to an open industry. And all of that's true. And, and I do believe that an empowered artist and a, a, a society of empowered artists equals an empowered business structure and an empowered industry. Um, what I think of as an empowered artist is not an artist who has access to a bunch of tools, um, but knows how to use them appropriately and uh, has them delivered in a way that is uh, sort of presented in a way that is, is like other things they use in their daily life. So it's not a big learning curve. Um, they can kind of jump right in. Um, so the first thing we built was a mobile app. Um, this was sort of our first iteration of the platform. Uh, it was uh, based on six modules. You can't really see them, but it was around scheduling finances, um, industry search database that we connected to, um, and your performances. And then we had two other modules. One was called AGTV, which is basically this library of uh, video content, PDFs, um, just all the stuff provided by different experts in the industry, producers, engineers, uh, studio owners, record label executives, lawyers. So people could go in on their mobile phone and they could tap it and they could just watch through this content. And, the, and then we had a thing called Action Packs where we basically uh, met with experts and we put together um, lists of things to do, uh, whether it was promoting a show. So when you added a gig to your schedule, all the things you needed to do to promote it landed on your schedule at the time point you were supposed to do it. And then it was hyperlinked to a video of an expert promoter telling you what to say and what not to say when you call the radio station for the first time. Those kinds of things. Um, I put the little praying mantis on there because, like I said, you know, I was a poetry major. We uh, were touring songwriters and all of a sudden dove into this world of software development. And so we launched it. We built it in five months on Android, iOS, and uh, lightly on the web. And once we got three, 4,000 users in the first quarter that we were out there, we realized these bugs were, were coming back in and we had to start to manage to learn how to build something that would work as it scaled. Um, so we went through this process of fixing bugs and dealing with bugs at the same time trying to build out our vision of getting to the web um, 
And in the process of that, we started talking to professional managers. Uh, we ended up building a, a solution for agencies. Vector Management was the first agency that, that adopted this platform for their roster. They use it today currently, as do a couple others. Um, and what we'll be launching soon, uh, you see here, is a new web, actual web platform that's synced to our mobile apps and all of our enterprise tools, which is creating really unprecedented levels of data integration and correlative analysis. Um, I've spent the better part of the summer making partnerships in, uh, with a lot of these companies, some of them aren't listed here, to where data is going to be piping in, data is going to be going out. It's really going to be a, a level of integration that's never existed before that I'm super pumped about. This is a, a screenshot of one of our, of our report center, so you can do real correlative analysis based on your sales with your web traffic, your social imprint, and it comes back in a really digestible way and gives artists some sort of leverage tool when they're looking for investment that they can... Uh, um, go and actually quantify their value and, and deal with money people to move their career forward. So that's, okay. that's it real quick. All right, great. Thanks so much. And I'm going to now turn it over to my reaction panel to react. Um, I noticed on your slide with the, um, with the graph, it had a, with expenses, uh, negative net. Uh, very accurate slide <laughs> for a touring artist. Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, your app, it's an app-based. You download it from iTunes. It's on your phone, right? Yep. Okay. Currently. currently. So right now you would download it from uh, the iTunes App Store or the Android Marketplace. Or you can go to the website and you can, create an, you can create your own little account there, and then it will sync through a web service to the mobile apps. Okay. And in terms of user interface, so like I, I have a group with... with two other guys and a manager and a booking agent. Mm -hmm. How does this work when multiple users are logging in and changing data? Right. So everybody who is associated with an account is assigned a level of a permission um, that dictates what data they can see and what data they can change. Um, and so when they log into the account, certain things are just not accessible to them or not presented at all. Um, and for instance, in this new platform, in the new iteration of the dashboard, you see down here there's sort of this activity feed in the bottom right where you can post statuses, some things that you're doing, and it will ping the people's phones and the team. Uh, one of those things would be closing out a show at the end of the night. That data would appear in that feed, but if you didn't have the permission to see or work with financials, it wouldn't appear in your feed. So th the team is able to determine who sees what. And like for, for example, Vector, you know, they have several different levels of managers working with several different artists. And so they all need different kinds of access and different ways to export calendars and all those kinds of things that come with day to day. So what fees do you charge? How do you make money? Well, right now, we, uh, for the mobile app, we haven't charged. We haven't charged all year. We, we've let people use it for free. Um, we've got thousands and thousands of users. We get feedback from them on a daily basis. And we've been trying to refine and understand really what was being used, what wasn't, analyzing the data. For instance, AGTV, the videos, the educational component, was watched um, so much. But people weren't really using um, the industry search database like we thought they would. So we've been learning and letting people use it for free. The enterprise product we do charge for, and that's just a, an individual you know, sales channel. So depending on the length of the contract they sign with us, uh, the number of artists they're going to be using, the number of the size of their management agency, how much personal customer support. So we give our enterprise agencies their own team of humans that actually help them work with the software, work with their artists, and make sure their thing is running. So that human element, you know, has a cost. So it just depends. Um, when we launch uh, this new product, there will be some uh, some prices associated with it. We're keeping it cheap. And that's part of the network of partnerships that we've been building is depending on who else you're working with. So if you have a Topspin account, a TuneCore account, and an Artist Growth account, uh, you know, or your InGrooves does your distribution and you're, you're using Topspin for something or Pledge Music to fund your music and you're also using Artist Growth, we're all working together to keep it cheap for the artist. Um, so not only are we sharing data for the artists that we share in common, but we're, we're trying to, you know, give each other price breaks and discounts. So I'd, it would never go over $10 a month from my side for an artist, but, uh, you know, if you're with partners, people I work with, that can come down even, you know, to depending on the nature of the relationship. I, I don't want to hog this, just one, one more quick question. In terms of logistics, what sort of um, interface does it have in terms of that? Like, you, f for me personally, like, right. one of the biggest challenges being out on the road is like, okay, how long does it take to get from this airport, from where I'm staying at this hotel to this airport, right. to the venue? How much time do I need to allot? What's the best way to get there, et cetera? Just, just having like a field for notes, like, all right, leave 45 minutes early, leave from here, take this route or whatever. Right. 
So in the, in the day sheet or in the schedule module, as it were, in the system, uh, there's a place to put notes and things like that. Um, as far as automating the process of directions and things like that, you know, we have these conversations every day in our meetings. Do we want to try to bring, you know, Google Maps in here? Do we want to try to fight Google Maps? Or are people just going to open up Google Maps because that's what they've been doing for years and that's what they do? So let's put our investment and our time and resources into developing something that does not yet exist. Um, you know, and the future of of the digital ecosystem, I love hearing that word because it's really happening and it might, it, it's solidifying. And the application protocol interface uh, that is, is going to be how we all connect and are able to move data around to give artists access to what they need when they need it. And that's the goal. Um, it's a little hard for me to comment on this without actually playing with it. Sure. You know, and doing a real demo. Yep. Um, but I do like how you've integrated, you know, with so many of the companies that we work with um, yeah. as, as artists and managers. Um, this is probably more an opinion. I guess it's all an opinion. But um, I didn't see the need to kind of diss direct a fan because that's just, we, we all realize that's a piece of the puzzle. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. But I think the, the myth that a lot of independent artists who, who aren't like the entrepreneurial level of artists, you know, the people who are out there and get, understand a little bit about business, most of these artists out there don't know what they're doing. Um, they're, they're really struggling and they pay for one service for six months and they don't know how to use it right. So they're frustrated and they drop it and they go to a new one and they pay for it. And they don't know how to use it right because they don't know anything about sales. Well, they can pick up Ariel Hyatt's book, you know. And, yeah, and, and she's, she's in our AGTV it, and, and I love Ariel. Um, and that, that's something that I think makes direct to fans so powerful is when people mm -hmm. start to learn how to use them, you know. And, right. You know. But I, I think most artists would agree that they're getting some revenue from that, some from digital retail, you know, some from the road. So I totally you know. agree. Didn't mean to diss it. Just kind of setting the stage for why we why we didn't build another content distribution platform. Right. Yeah. Um, I assume there's some sort of level for tour managers. Yes. Yeah. So uh, right now in the mobile apps, what we release for you know independents to use, there's limited permissions. Um, so it would be like you're an admin, you're a read only, or you're an owner of the account. When we built the enterprise one that say Vector's using. They have the tour manager, oh, so many different levels of permissions. And so we built, we built stuff for, for people to be able to use it in that way. And that, that's all web. So that's not even a native app. That's all responsive mobile web, um, which makes it a lot easier to build out all those layers of who can do what and see what. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, managers are certainly part of your target. And I, I think it's great that you've been demoing with Vector because you're exactly right. There's there's day-to-day -day managers. There's you know Ken. There's interns. So that, right. that's certainly important. Um, and yeah, I, I think it was a really smart point to bring up that all, all of this data and everything you're putting together is great leverage for an artist, you know, when they are looking for a bigger partner. So sure. that's smart. But yeah, it, it, it's hard for me to really dig in with this without um, trying it, which I'd love to try it. If, if you don't Absolutely. Mind. Yeah, I want you all to try it and tell us what you don't like about it and what you do. And we, and we really look at anybody who's doing something with an artist online as a potential partner, as somebody that... that if we share an artist in common, then we should be doing something to help that artist get the data they need when they need it and help teach them how to use these tools. I mean, that's, that's really where it comes from at the end of the day. Um, what genre-related tools have you developed uh, specifically? When I'm dealing with something like, like I have a, a number of different artists across a wide range of genres, the tools that I need when I'm dealing with something like the Duke Ellington Estate are much different then I deal with something like if I'm dealing with Wynton Marcellus. Uh, the tools that I need for Wynton Marcellus are much different than when I'm dealing with somebody like Lauren Hill. So what genre-related tools have you specifically developed to, to help artist managers in between that? That's been a tough thing, um, and we talk about that a lot. How, how do you serve the needs of a DJ with a software platform and the needs of a folk singer, and where they're coming at psychologically to technology, the people they're dealing with in their market and how they work. I mean, it's really complicated and complex. Um, I think what we're just trying to do right now is take in as much information from everybody in those sectors uh, of the industry as we possibly can so we can understand what nuances do you want and then how can we put that into a system that would be valuable to the, to the majority of our users. So, so I would say, like, I would sit down with you and try to learn everything I could learn about what each of your different kinds of artists need. What are the nuances about the promoters they work with, their, their day-to-days, looking at finances, um, and then see where we can build those nuances into the system to make it better for everybody. 
with the capability to manage uh, the royal, is that just for managing royalty pay payments or ca calculations? Or no, so we, we, we do like ad hoc revenues where you can just like quick uh, ad revenue. You can pop a picture. If you spend money, you can pop a picture of a receipt, categorize it, it stores it in the cloud. You can print out a report of all your receipts in a PDF with location date stamped on it. At the end of the year, you can export it to um, Excel to go into any of your financial stuff, as well as you can, you know, we did deal with uh, the PROs to where you can, at the end of the night, we boiled down the live performance royalty registration process. So is that process. just expenditures in regards to the touring cost, or I mean royalty Whatever. statements, or is that the royalties in regards to uh, record companies, or merchandise sales, or things of that nature? Or yeah, if we can get an API for it, we'll pipe the data in. Um, the only real royalty API we have right now is, is the live performance royalty registration with the performing rights organizations. We're, we're the first company that they have been willing to give a direct API to their, their databases and allow us to, to let artists submit their performances and playlists for live performance royalties. Um, and we've been able to boil that down to one click, which is, if you've ever tried to do it on BMI's website or ASCAP's website in the past, it's a long process. Um, you know, it's like 30 or so clicks per song, per playlist, and it's hard when you're out there on the road, especially if you're an independent, to go back and, and you know, retroactively enter all of those playlists. My last uh, question or comment is, um, how do I deal with the interactivity if I have 20 different artists. And let's say some of the artists have, yeah. a serv have one service to do, to do one aspect and another artist has a different service to do the exact same right. aspect. How do I deal with those multiple artists in between uh, by using one account? Uh, right. So, so if you look at this screen, like uh, you would have all like the, the landing page would be all, uh, an icon of all of your artists. You would tap them and it would take you into their accounts. So you can really quickly navigate between the artists on your roster. Um, as far as one artist is using this service and other artist is using that service, um, that's just a part of my work as I'm going around and I'm trying to integrate with as many as I can so we can cover the basis for everybody if they're using InGrooves is doing their distribution or TuneCore is doing it or, or whoever. So. so you're saying that through that one feed right there, I can get to each artist's account and set it up as to their spe specifics. Sure, yeah, you would have your own URL and you'd, you'd, when you went to it, your artist roster would appear. You, you'd just be logged in. And then, uh, you know, and then once you're in the system, um, up there where it says the black lilies in the corner, like you could just tap that and your roster would drop down and you'd tap an artist and go into their account. Um, after this, I'd love to hear what business managers are digging this because I'm always looking for business managers that understand technology and aren't threatened by it and are open to it. I am too. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. We should talk about that. Thank you, guys. I think up next, uh, up next is Cash Music. Hi, uh, I am Jesse Von Doom from Cash Music, uh, along with Maggie Vale. I'm the co-executive director. Um, we we're a small nonprofit organization, um, and we work directly with artists to build open source and free tools for them to use in distributing, selling, promoting their music. Um, Pardon me. Um, I have a monitor. I don't want to break it. So um, yeah, uh, there. Um, so basically, uh, the, t the kinds of tools we built have been things like, um, you know, direct download sales, email collection, um, some intelligence around those areas, uh, things, uh, pretty much any workflow we could get our hands on, uh, streaming music, secure streams, previews, etc. Um, and it all started uh, with ideas driven by artists. This is uh, Kristen Hirsch. She sits on our board. And um, really, the, the impetus for cash came out of a conversation that she had with Danita Sparks of L7 um, about six years ago now. Uh, they were having a conversation about CSAs and farm shares. And what they wanted to do was uh, put their music out and find a way that would work for them, because what was happening in the past wasn't working for them anymore. Um, we, they started talking. That started going to their managers. The managers started talking. They talked to us. We, had known each other and um, started this thing where we didn't really know what we were starting. We didn't know it was open source and we didn't know it was nonprofit. Um, we just knew that we were trying to build a subscription service for them specifically. Um, it's worked and it should actually be pointed out today in, in conversation with streaming and everything else too that Kristen Hirsch actually has uh, a, an audience subscription service all her own now that actually basically pays her a salary and lets her record her music and get it to her fans and that's something that works for her and uh, it's an interesting model, and what it made us realize is that we needed to speak to artists directly about what they needed. 
Um, and we needed to trust them as smart and innovative people who could figure out what they needed um, from the situation. So we, over the course of four or five years, worked on over 170 live projects. Uh, started with scripts, the scripts turned into ideas, those ideas turned into one project after another project after another project. Um, and what happened was we um, found our platform by working with people directly. One of the core things, and Maggie touched on this before, is that not all art is built to scale, and it's a very important piece. Every, art, every audience is different, um, and every solution is different. So what we realized was that what we needed to do is find a baseline of tools that um, would essentially guarantee artists uh, certain access to functionality, no matter what their scale, what their size, and what business constraints were out there, um, who they were working with, a partner was. Um, we wanted to find a way to do it that was cooperative, that could actually work with innovative new businesses, um, while always guaranteeing the artist has access to their data and to their services. Um, so what we built was uh, a platform that could be used both by artists and by developers. Uh, we use the same language for developers as for artists in an attempt to actually bring them together. Uh, the platform here, uh, this is a look at our, um, our admin backend. Um, this shows you the sort of the split, the assets, the people, the commerce, uh, calendar, and then what we're calling elements, which is essentially workflow. Uh, think App Store for a musician's website, um, things that can be highly customized uh, and made to be as flexible as possible uh, with artists working on their own accounts. So um, things like adding an album can use, uh, right now it uses Amazon's S3 with your own account. It can use, uh, we're building features for Dropbox, for Google Drive, for any kind of storage you might have, no problem. Uh, doing commerce stuff, uh, it'll work with PayPal right now, again, your own accounts, um, and uh, can work with Stripe, can work with other payment processors. That entire thing is abstracted by the platform can also be used by developers uh, to, to build new solutions and completely new things uh, just as a programming interface. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go fast. Um, these are the core things we've been shipping with, um, things like digital purchase, download codes, um, sign-in type things for fan clubs, et cetera. Um, and really, uh, the, way that we've, the way we've tackled this is to deliver a platform that can be used in multiple ways. So we have not launched our hosted thing yet. We're actually uh, in the process of putting it up. And actually, next week, uh, our artist members get to start playing with hosted stuff for the first time. Um, we've been shipping this as an installable download, much like a WordPress type thing. Um, you can download it, install it easily. It, it installs all on screen like a website. Uh, very simple process. Um, we can also, uh, we're doing it so that there's uh, it's completely compatible with a thing called Cloud Foundry, which is a, a sort of um, standardized hosting component, so people can launch uh, their own hosted version very easily. And obviously, we have a, a free hosted solution coming as well. So you can tow into the water however you like, with a hosted account, playing around on your own server, or if you're a management company, for example, just installing uh, our hosted version all yourself. Um, the end result, though, is that things like this happen, where if you want to do a purchase, you put it in the system, you can uh, put it out as an HTML5 widget. It could be a WordPress plugin, um, and it, it can work uh, directly on your site using a simple single line of PHP. So that's how things have all been built and developed. A um, couple examples of things we've built in the past. I'm out of time, so I'm cheating. Uh, oops. And then I broke that. All right. Um, I think the point in the end, and, and I'll, I'll wrap it up and I know I'm over time by a minute, but uh, I think the point in the end was really trying to involve artists in this actual process itself by working with them directly was, it, it was sort of the most important thing to us. Um, you know, you heard Tim Westergren, Tim Westergren today talk about how uh, his business is barely keeping his, its chin above water, and I think that's an important point for us to all realize that um, the technology sector is in a, hard, in a hard place, but Artists have their head so far underwater now, they're learning how to breathe underwater and swim. And I think that we should actually trust their guidance in, in building these platforms and listen to them for what they need. But I will shut up and listen to questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Who's first? So how does this integrate with my Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, right. website, all of it? Yep. Uh, basically, um, the way we do it, we have two different ways of integrating. But we've abstracted everything out so you can either go and if you're feeling fancy, you could um, set up your own Twitter, uh, Twitter app and plug in the keys and the secrets and stuff, and that will use things like Tweet for Download, for example, is one of the things we, we built a long time ago um, and that we're integrating into the platform uh, on the admin side, too. Um, you could also do it with an OAuth type account. So for hosted, you just click a button, log in, and, and you're off and, and running. So. And how do you all make money? 
we uh, we are a nonprofit. So one of the things um, that we've done in the past, we've done sponsorships uh, to date. We've done a Kickstarter um, that raised about sixty thousand dollars from thirteen or fourteen hundred people, um, and we have uh, we have various sponsorships and relationships with different companies. Um, Mozilla and Google have helped us out. Uh, going forward, we are working on a membership organization. So we have two hundred fifty artist members to date. Um, that's a fully free thing and we'll always have free members, but we're also looking at a, a value add membership tier. So that will be a sort of ongoing fundraiser. Uh, I have a question. I'll, I'll fill in for you a little bit, Emily, if that's all right. All right. Um, so does your, uh, does your platform allow you to do, uh, like gating, tweet gating, mm -hmm. um, email exchange for media, mm -hmm. uh, and then populate the CRM application of my choice or is a CRM a part of your platform? As well right we we have um, we're working on it now on a sort of a, a more of a micro level CRM it's not the sort of Salesforce type thing where it, it's insanely robust because that's I think I'd probably kill myself if I had to build that but but uh, yeah we work on some lightweight features like that but the data portability is actually a major issue right now we've uh, been talking to a few people about data export formats as well of all the data including including commercial uh, transaction data and history and everything uh, one of the things we believe uh, at our core is that an artist should be able to click a button export their entire history and have it move from service to service so all that data can can go and can export so yeah. right and actually as, as part of the integration I'm curious about integrating with uh, you know, not just the CRM, but all, also as a part of CRM for it to be valuable mm -hmm. is the ability to work with a good email delivery right. uh, platform, you know, whether yep. it's FanBridge or Exact Target or We've whatever been working with MailChimp um, a lot. Uh, Do you and work with any others or? Uh, we we, we don't. For the most part, what we've been doing now, because we are so we are um, we're small, I mean, there's, it's a two person organization. So we've been what we've been doing is we've been building abstractions. So what we've done for MailChimp isn't we didn't write specifically to MailChimp. We wrote an internal flow that could be used by any uh, anyone that has an API exposed. So we've then taken Mail Mailchimp's API and sort of beaten it up and, and made it work with that. So that's the same thing. We can basically write drivers for any any third party API and have them slot into commerce or into managing people or or both. So that's how we've attacked it. Um, how does someone become a member? Uh, right now, just just ask. Um, you know, we uh, part of part of the reason we haven't opened up to the public yet is just because um, we're about to do testing on our hosted stuff. And once we go into that testing process, I think we're going to open the membership up fully to the public. Uh, we just needed to limit the amount of feedback we get because uh, one developer, two people with eyes on it, and then a team of volunteers. Uh, it's going to be really hard for us if we get more than those 250 people uh, in our ears. So we have 250 people that we trust who span genres, who span ages, who span, you know, everything we get to span, basically. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, so we, we trust that we have the right people. Um, and uh, yeah, anybody who wants uh, to be a member or who wants to talk to us more about seeing things, by all means, uh, just, just email us or get in touch or, or be whatever. And you're welcome to, to play with things. Um, so if, if someone knows nothing about HTML, mm -hmm. like what would you recommend for that? Like how would you recommend they, they dig into this? Um, well, as right now, I mean, they're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to have embeds happen. So we're thinking of it a lot like an, a YouTube movie. Um, we have an HTML5 embed that works pretty much exactly like that now, where uh, we just went into testing about two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago with that um, sort of wider, wider public. It's actually being used by bands uh, like Viva Voce uh, just launched a new website and a new record um, using our HTML5 widgets. And, uh, and basically just like you grab a, grab a link, paste it into, into whatever system you're using, if it's Tumblr or, or something custom, throw it on a page and, and hit save and it, and it works. It, it displays the entire workflow, spits it all out. Um, and that's, that's actually a big... A big driver of the entire platform is this idea of taking the entire workflow and making that workflow go from place to place. So if that's, I'm a developer and I'm using PHP, you have a PHP way to do it. If, if it's, uh, you know, you want to copy and paste an HTML5 widget or a WordPress plugin, uh, just, again, WordPress plugin is, is one line of code. You drop it anywhere in WordPress and it starts to work, so. Right. Um, I, I am biased, of course, but I, I just love you as a designer and I, I just, the platform is so, it just appears so simple, you know, for the artists mm -hmm. and their team and, and also for the fans. So I, I really appreciate that as a manager. And just real quickly, I don't know how much you can get into this, but um, with a band like the Lumineers that have a hit mm -hmm. right now um, at radio, 
Are you guys seeing, and I, I can ask Kristen this too, but are you guys seeing spikes in the direct to fan example that you gave, or is it mostly the hardcore fans? That was actually a very fans? unfortunate example. I took the screenshot when I was thinking they were a relative unknown uh, several months ago. Um, we, we actually did, uh, we did a pre-release stream for the Lumineers. We didn't do anything direct to fan. Um, so we, uh, we serviced outlets and, uh, and mostly media folks. So um, that's one of the components that we've built over the years is uh, a Pre, a pre-press or, you know, very early press stages, uh, streams of records and things like that, that were secure, that couldn't leak, um, but that we wanted to have some flexibility with and some, some things like that, so, yeah. That'd be a fun experiment to try. <laughs> um, so, in your presentation, if I'm looking at the platform, mm -hmm. it's not totally DIY. It's something that you would have to have, like, your coding staff or, or, or your, or your um, internet staff deal with that were programmers potentially, right? Not, not necessarily. We do have a hosted solution coming. We're, we're in testing on that next week, and that one is literally just sign up with an email address, get a password, and you're good. Um, and yeah, from there, you can, you can just copy and paste everything like you would with a YouTube video, like I said. Oh, but. And you said your future plans to generate revenue involve mm -hmm. premium services. What price tiers are you looking at for premium services? Uh, not not premium revenue? services that way so much. As, uh, as a nonprofit with members, uh, we were actually looking to do, we've been talking to various companies and organizations about like, say, let's, let's just say rental car discounts, thinking mm -hmm. about it more like a AAA type, type of thing. So we have members who, who could actually have services going across, the pl uh, across different, different worlds. So like pretty much things that, uh, different fees and different services getting breaks across the industry for our members and that's that's the kind of thing we'd like to do because we're doing more in the sort of outreach education uh, uh, with our members right now as well so um, we don't we will not uh, be charging artists directly for services the only thing we would charge for would be something like uh, if we were uh, if we if we built a big content delivery network type thing that cost us money we'd pass it on to artists but at cost so would that content delivery option involve something like you make the capability to have discounts for downloads, um, and you say you take funding through PayPal for that? You, I mean, uh, would you? No, no, no. I mean, like file hosting. You know right, what I'm saying, right. yeah. So if we have file hosting and cost us money, we would say, you know, you you used you know 87 cents of our stuff this week. Mm -hmm. You owe us 87 cents. Um, okay. Yeah, we're not we're not charging artists for for any of the services. So is that just um, at this time you're not charging artists? No, for no, we, we are not, will not, will never charge for our service for artists. Absolutely not. Well, how can I ensure that in 10 years you won't go under? If you we might. That's the beauty business. of open source, you see, is that everything we're doing is out in the public. You could download the source code. You could build your own business off of it. So, so the so whole that's idea. That's how it'll be available to me in 10 years. It will always be available to you, and it also cannot be bought and cannot be closed. That's the whole, that's the whole point with both nonprofit and open source. It's, uh, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a guarantee that that stuff cannot be taken over. Sony can't come along and buy the company because it's not a company to buy. Um, there is no ownership in the company. I don't profit. I can't sell it, and I can't pull twenty million dollars out of it this year. And there's nothing like that that I could possibly do. So, um, yeah, this is this is a very firmly held belief that artists need access to this. They need to be able to guarantee access to this, and it has to be something that is an open future on an open web, or artists are just going to keep finding the next piece of lock-in, and we're trying to avoid that. So, all right, great. Thanks so much. Right. Appreciate you. Thanks. Like Okay, our next five-minute presentation and uh, questions will be with a huge fan. Oh, that's the narrative. Okay. Let's see how we do this. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, nice to see you. And I'm, this goes left and front. Am I getting it right? Oh, someone else is, is driving as well. Uh, my name is Chris McDonald. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Huge Fan. It's a marketplace where uh, performers and entertainers sell, offer uh, in-person experiences to their biggest fans. So um, we make it possible to meet your hero like these three did. They didn't believe they got the chance to hang out after, uh, after a show with Warner Theopolis, um, who's a Warner uh, artist, uh, or uh, the, the uh, family is a, believe it or not, it was a father and a son who got the day training with a world champion heavyweight, Seth Mitchell. Or um, the dad and son who gushed over dinner with um, um, Mostly Bears lead singer um, and, uh, and, and got to hang out with him as a, as a special guest. So, uh, 
basically, uh, fans are telling us their dreams because you can also request them as much as purchase them. And we try to do whatever we can to make them come true. <laughs> so uh, let's baseline the new normal in the music industry. You know, I don't need to explain much to you guys except to say that there's big pain points and the first two um, there's not enough of. And, um, you know, frankly, there's, it, they have a big impact on the, the third. So we focus on the first two. Um, and we do that on tour. Over 170,000 um, performers and entertainers make over half their income uh, touring uh, live and performing live. And there's over 62 million uh, people in the U.S. who self-identify as um, super fans or as extremely interested in their heroes. So we're about connecting them up. And what we've also noticed uh, is that, um, let's just take a look at this, is that um, basically, excuse me, um, that uh, when it comes to promoting a specific live event, there's not a whole lot there that really makes a difference. And um, there's this cognitive dissidence between what performers and venues are, we see are offering and what you know, fans, really diehard fans, are hoping and would care about. So, you know, for example, who's a fan of a tour, right? It, and we kept on finding these like, websites talking about the tour, and it just seemed like there is, you know, people care about what they uh, are going to see that night. They're, and they're excited, they're going to bring their friends, they're going to talk about it. And so, um, why are these websites not geared for that specific night? Well, it's hard and it's not a good use of funds, right? Everybody's focusing on, you know, outcome, but it's really hard and expensive to create these pop-up communities that dissipate as quickly as they, um, as they form. So we saw an opportunity to help performers make money or make money for their cause uh, and make their fans deliriously happy. So let me show you how we do that. So entertainers use our free tour dashboard. This is a pre-populated pre landing page, one for each show. So it includes things that fans responded, uh, respond to, like countdowns coming up, or created, uh, curated social feeds, or testimonials. Managing these pages are automatic. We pull data from information, so artists obviously don't have to. So here's another example. Um, lots of us are huge fans of Aziz. So uh, let's go through the process. Um, Inside of each is a huge fan experience, an after party in this case. So, uh, you know, Frank is a, is a big fan of uh, Aziz. He can't believe the chance is that he gets to hang out with him. So he, um, he goes in, and lo and behold, look, there's, there is uh, an Aziz opportunity. He clicks in. He sees there's two left. He makes the purchase. Uh, in this case, he signs up with Facebook. And within a minute, he has made that purchase. And he is going to a, um, a party with his hero, and Aziz is making money, and we take a 12% transaction fee. So at the party, kind of bow, you know, this is one very happy super fan, right? Uh, we believe this is the, the future of fan entertainment where performers are, are making more money on tour. They're doing it within their own schedules, and... Um, and there's, um, you know, a real opportunity for uh, these brand advocates to, to really talk about the experience because you know they're going to be sharing it. So uh, we got a good team together um, to kind of help us steer and get our, get our, get our next um, deals going. And uh, what we're really about is creating deliriously happy moments in people's lives. So uh, we're currently in the process of raising some funds. Um, uh, our, we have big plans, um, 500,000 experiences in 36 months. And so our next round uh, is geared towards getting 2,500 of those experiences. And uh, we believe we're in a great position to do it. Um, we've got uh, five free opportunities. If you want to stop by uh, with me uh, to talk, uh, over 100 free experiences for a pro account that I'd be happy to uh, discuss with the right partners. All right, thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you. So, so Chris, what, what if I don't want to charge my fan $175? What if, say, I, I, I love my fans, what if I say I want it to be free for them? The, the, the platform is free to use. You don't have to have the huge fan experience, and you can offer it for free. So, you know, so I just log in and create it myself and right now we're concierging the system, meaning we're just 
adminning and learning and getting our kind of our, our feet wet and uh, we launched in April new companies abound um, and the next step is once we really refine that workflow then we're gonna open up so one of the reasons you probably uh, haven't heard a lot of people doing is that we're taking you know we're going artist to artist and just asking them those sorts of questions and what we've realized is that you know that's still an, a great opportunity for uh, for use free is fine so at some point in the future I could hit you up and and have an idea for it and you'd put it on a huge fan and it could be free for the fans yeah and even so twelve percent of zero and you're still willing to do that yeah no we're willing to you know offer it up and and allow people to use it and see what happens cool. you know um, uh, it's it's gonna still it'll still be a huge fan experience I am going to take you up on that awesome. at some point in the future I'm happy I'm gonna clap um, so no doubt this is a great revenue stream for artists with their hardcore fans. We do things like this pretty frequently. Um, we also do them on our own, so I don't necessarily need to cut someone in. What is very appealing to me, though, is how you're asking fans what they want. Um, so I really liked how you flipped that question around uh, to come up with things that the artists or I haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just going to be extremely appealing to managers. I mean, there's so many great tools and things like that, but if you can come to us as managers and say, yeah. you know, this fan wants to do this, you know, this special thing with Brendan Benson that you haven't thought of, I'm gonna be all over that, you know? But if it's just a dinner, a sound check, things like that, sure. we're totally already doing it. So I, I'd love that. I'd love to get my artists in your system and, and see what people are interested in. And I definitely applaud, uh, applaud you for working with comedians. Um, my business partner would be thrilled about that. There's countless music conferences, but there, are, you know, comedy doesn't get talked about as much. So I, I'm glad that's working for you with Aziz. And um, you know, I, I'd love to be proved wrong on, on doing it myself and and to try something with the the athlete that we work with. Well, thanks. Um, we really probably the biggest thing that people react uh, kindly and excited about are the demand side stuff. And we've seen lots of companies, you know, really try to carve that out. And we've seen a lot of pivoting and reiteration. Um, it always boils down to who's in the position of asking. So to have an artist ask the question, even if it's not on a huge fan, it's just a really great process to say, hey, I'm coming to New York. What should I do? And then, you know, you, the outliers, he's like, no, we're not going on a date. But, uh, you know, maybe we will go up in the Empire State Building together. Who knows? I, I have a question sort of to follow up on what Emily was saying. Um, with the artists that we work, that I work with, we work with, you know, really big artists like Lil Wayne and, Nicki Minaj and you know as a part of the touring that we do they they have these things we have these things built in we'll hold back a portion of the tickets and we'll sell them to you know fans for a lift you know so maybe the ticket price is a hundred dollars and we'll sell tickets for three hundred and fifty dollars or four hundred dollars yep. but for that additional margin they get this experience this VIP experience but you know it becomes easier it becomes easy for us to work with you know, for instance, Ticketmaster or Live Nation because of the marketing power that we have to promote those kinds of things. So how would you do that? Could you do things where you bundle ticket prices in? Uh, do you work with Ticketmaster? How, how, do you, how would you see that relationship work? Uh, currently, we don't work with Ticketmaster. We're consciously um, looking for opportunities where we're not necessarily going head to head with you know, an entrenched incumbent company. Um, our, our current average of an experience price isn't $10,000 an experience. It's slightly over 500. We believe we can get that, edge that up to say 1,000. There's a lot of $500 uh, experiences. That's not to say uh, that we wouldn't love to work with your artists, but at this point, we believe that the power is gonna come from the use. The venues are then gonna come to us because they're gonna realize, oh gosh, you know, look at what's going on nearby at the, uh, you know, the, the coffee shop beside where we are, and we are fully prepared to give uh, complete cred and, uh, and relationships to those venues, uh, and then through that, we, we, we're gonna be marketing out um, ticket. Because really, the, the, the reality is, when someone cares about the event, their most highest focus time is at the point of purchase, so we are absolutely focusing on getting in on that. But no, not a deal with Ticketmaster just yet. So you're telling me then that your revenue stream is coming from the 12% of whatever it is that 
the uh, uh, price is for the, uh, for the event. Is that correct? That is correct. These are ticketed events. We have mm -hmm. a, um, a bidding system already built and in place, and we are developing a uh, contest model. Is, is well. there a bottom end to the bidding system? Like we you say we don't uh, want something? We, there, there's, you could do a no reserve. We mm -hmm. uh, recommend a cap so you can kind of manage where you want to head. Right? So it's really up to you, just like with any other bidding system. So basically, if everybody decided that they didn't want to charge for any of the services, you would never see the 12% and you could go out of business that way. Well, there's a lot of very, very successful freemium model um, businesses out there, and we, we don't believe that, um, that uh, people will uh, – we're going to try to provide as much ease as possible. But at the end of the day, it's a time and resource issue. You know, mm -hmm. artists – and their managements are obviously uh, rightfully complaining that they don't have enough time in the day to get from point A to point B. It's where companies like, like, um, like Artist Growth and, and Bandcamp come in has really helped to reduce that time level when they're extending all of their assets out. And, um, and uh, Cash Music is you know, t really taking a, a piece out of that as well. So that's great. But at the end of the day, you know, do you want to spend three or four hours preparing something? And, um, unless it's going to a cause, which is also very laudable um, mm -hmm. and, and a great, great way to do it, um, there's often some de minimis amount of transaction. My, my con I have one concern, and my one concern is this, as Brian is well aware, when you have a fan like Nicki Minaj, she has, uh, let's say, some probably overzealous fans sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if there's a bidding system and that overzealous fan is willing, willing to bid higher than everybody else, for some artists, that might pose a security risk because as a manager, you need to control who has access to your artists at one time. It uh, it's it's a it's a yeah, it's you know. a realistic problem, and when we get to the level where security becomes an issue, we address it head on, and it becomes a part of the roll up of the uh, the experience. I would recommend trying to get into bed with promoters sooner rather than later because yeah. if you're doing any sort of performance album or performance element um, at the coffee shop next door, they're going to yell at me about radius clauses and, and things like that. So there is absolutely added value to what you're doing. So you might want to start with, you know, I don't know where you're based, but some local venues or smaller promoters and, and start bringing bigger promoters examples, because otherwise they're just going to get pissed off at both of us. Oh, that's a great point. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks so much. All right, for our last presentation, Song Kick. I'm in great company up here. Thank you, guys. All right. So my name is Brooke, and I am the artist ambassador at live music website Song Kick. I am also a working mus musician, so I very much know the plight of the struggling artist, maybe a little too well at some times. Um, so we started Song Kick with one mission, and that was to make it easier for fans to find out about concerts for their favorite artists. And we are a team of massive live music nerds ourselves, so we really just wanted more people to have that experience. So fast forward five years, and Songkick is now the second largest concert website after Ticketmaster. We have seven million monthly visitors, and we have the largest database of fan demand in the world. So that's fans telling us where they are and who they want to see live. So we spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand fans, but fans are really only half the equation. So in the last year, we've spent a lot of time working on artist tools to help make the lives of artists easier. Uh, one is a no-brainer, something you guys can kind of use right away. The other one is a bit more of an experiment, but something that we're very excited about. So the first one is called Tourbox, and it's tour date management tools for artists. So it's that enter once, publish across all of your websites thing that we've seen. And uh, even better than that, we also push all of those tour dates to all of our partners like YouTube, Spotify, Foursquare, Hype Machine, countless others. Um, so kind of getting those tour dates in front of the fans that are watching or listening but might not necessarily go out and seek out tour dates. The, that's what some of them look like. Um, the second artist tool is called Detour and it came about because as fans, live music fans, we really understand what it's like to wait and wait for your favorite band to come to town only to have them skip you over. And uh, 
traditionally, there's really been no way for fans to directly influence that. Ah, yes. De demand it. <laughs> um, so this is a map of my band's last European tour that we did. Oops. I accidentally pressed the button. Um, so I posted this map right after the tour and immediately got fans posting places they want us to come next time. So as an artist from the other side, I also know what it's like to constantly have your Facebook fans be posting places for you to come, uh, bemoaning the fact that you never tour there. But even more frustrating than that is the fact that it's usually logistically and financially impossible to do so because there's a lot of risk involved in touring. So Songkick in the last year have been working on a fan-funded touring platform called Detour. And it's really based off of that premise that your true fans will do more than just post a comment on Facebook. They will actually pledge money up front to bring you to their town. So here's an example. Um, Hot Chip wanted to do a show in kind of a new market for them in the UK. So we put on a detour with three potential dates in kind of off the beaten path cities. And this is what happened. There is a small town in southeastern UK called Folkestone. Went completely viral and sold out in a couple of hours. One fan personally emailed 2,000 of his friends to try and get them to pledge. <laughs> and oh. You can see where the line kind of slumps momentarily up there. That's when the people of Folkestone finally went to sleep for the night. <laughs> <laughs> so currently, we are working on what will be the largest crowdfunded tour ever. And that is really exciting because it's going to be Andrew Bird in six cities. And it's his first time in Latin America. So from an artist's perspective, I think there's a lot of really exciting things about Detour. You might be able to tour in new markets make more money, play to more people, just really take some of that risk out of touring. But I think for us, the, the most exciting thing that we've seen so far is the actual feel of the shows because they, they have this, this real electricity to them that normal shows really don't have. And I think that's because the fan feels ownership over the show and they really made it happen. And I think because of that, they feel that much more connected to the artist. So I think as Songkick moves forward on artist tools, this, this is really what we want to focus on. Like we want, we want artists to play more shows and better shows and to spend less time actually updating those shows online and more time kind of forging those deep connections with their true fans. So um, this is where you can find out more information. Please come talk to me. I'll give you a business card and would love to hear your thoughts on it. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple uh, quick, quick comments. So, um, one one slight issue that I have with Songkick as an artist is that whatever algorithm that you use to aggregate data from shows that come up as Will Eastman or Volta Bureau or whatever name I'm performing under at that mm -hmm. night, it if there is, for example, an early show mm -hmm. and a late show it will aggregate all of those artists. So for example, we recently did a, and this is just a bit of a pet peeve that I have both as an artist and a venue owner. Mm -hmm. We recently did an early show with San Etienne at U Street Music Hall, and there was a later show with Pontha de Prince and another artist. But on Songkick, it had them all together on one show. So then we as a venue and me as an artist get hit up by people saying like, that's a really weird bill. Why, why are all these artists <laughs> together? Yeah. And I'm saying that doesn't exist in reality. It's actually two separate shows, but Songkick has aggregated them, mm. and it's just. And I have no way of going onto your site and changing it. And we've tried to in the past, sort of hit hit up people, but it, it you know it takes some time for it yeah. to get changed. But and and uh, another um, really quick thing that I would mention is that as an artist. I feel a bit of fatigue in terms of like different services. Like, and uh, once you get to a certain stage, I don't know if it's just once you get older or once you get to so many social media sites, I actually want fewer. I don't want more. So one thing that would really um, help me and benefit me in terms of Songkick is if you had really tighter integration with Facebook and SoundCloud which are two of my primaries, and I kind of don't want to have to go to a second site to update dates. I'd just rather yeah. be able to do it all. 
Yeah, absolutely. Together. Okay. I'm going to try and remember all your points so I can address them all. So on the data side, obviously that's an issue that we struggle with all the time. Um, we aggregate from about 150 different sources. So it's, it's always kind of a trade-off because an algorithm that's matching, you know, a very complicated data set, it's, it's either you get duplicates or you combine things that you don't want combined. So that's why we launched Tourbox is kind of, you can think of it as a, like a dashboard for Songkick. So you can go in there and control those shows, separate them out. Um, and yeah, I mean, data concerns like that are always something that we're thinking about. Um, Wait, can I have a follow-up on that? Yes. Are you doing something... I'm sorry, so one of the issues that I have um, is making sure that with respect to social media sites, that there's um, communication between the real person, mm -hmm. you know, so that we, you know, like with Twitter, they've got the verified accounts and, you know, how are you, what are you guys doing to make sure that you're actually getting information from Will? If he's going to make a mm -hmm. change to the date, how do you know it's not, you know, me pretending to be Will? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, when you we have tons of issues <laughs> with imposter accounts. Yeah, of course. Of it's course. a huge Especially issue. at that level. When you sign in to Tourbox with your Songkick account, you basically, with your user account, can manage multiple artist pages on, on Songkick and Tourbox. So um, if it's like Nicki Minaj or something like that, like you have to request access, and we kind of work with you to, to figure out that you are who you say you are. Um, but to go back to your point about artist fatigue, I am a touring musician myself. I absolutely know what that feels like. Um, and I think that's why Songkick have really kind of moved away from making your making another profile for you to update. Like we don't allow you to put bios and stuff like that, you know, because we really just want to feed into all of your other sites and make your life easier. And I think as long as we're prov providing value in that in that way, then that's, that's where we want to be. And we do have a Facebook app. We have an exclusive integration with SoundCloud, so you literally put in your artist URL from Songkick and it just pulls automatically. Yeah. My team loves Tourbox. So, yeah, they, awesome. they are psyched on it. Detour makes me want to cry tears of joy. I have thought of this idea, and mm -hmm. I approached multiple online ticketing platforms as well as crowdfunding companies, mm -hmm. and it didn't fit into what they'd built already. So it's, it's so brilliant. I have all the information on our artists on, you know, through Google Analytics and things like that, and I, I just haven't had... I, I, I'm so into the idea of pre-selling tickets, especially, you know, the hot chip example is great, but there's times where I've launched a new artist and mm -hmm. I have all this promo and I have all these things going on and I'm so sick of booking shows and maybe even spending money on promo and hoping that people show up. And I, I've, I've wanted to do this. So I, I have a new band that I want to try this with. And even at the mid-level, you know, mid-sized touring level, it, it's really valuable mm -hmm. because it's expensive to tour and we only want to go to places where, you know, we're drawing. So again, I, I have all this information Way too many booking agents don't care, and a lot of platforms I talk to just, it didn't fit. So I, I'm, I'm really, really pumped to talk to you about that. Yeah, one, one example that really fits with that is the actual very first detour that we did was this guy from San Francisco called Tycho, and he had never been to Europe before, and we brought him to London for his first European show. And that was the perfect case study because he had never been there, so promoters weren't willing to take a risk. So he literally had no other way to get there. But we knew, because we have such a massive database of live fan demand, that he had 500 fans in London that wanted to see him play, and it was an amazing show. Awesome. Yeah, I, I never would have thought of contacting you guys, but tell Ian he needs to email me more. Okay. <laughs> so um, when you do the, the uh, um, suggested performance locations, and when you know, 500 people say they want to be in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and, and want to see the, my artist perform, um, th there's a couple of questions that I have in regards to just that that scenario. First of all, you said that they could financially commit uh, 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 to that. How does that work? And what happens to that money, the dispensation? How does that get out there? Because, you know, you, I could email 5,000 of my closest Facebook mm -hmm. friends and say, hey, go, you know, vote for this or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when time for, for the artist to come and perform, nobody can find them anywhere. So, I mean, you know, everybody, nobody has a credit card information. Nobody has anything. So how does that, that work itself? 
Yeah, so right now the, the form that it's taken is, is kind of a competi competition between cities. So we actually pre-authorized the credit card of the fans. So like for Andrew Bird, we put on, I think it was 12 to 15 cities in, in Latin America. Um, and then the top six that reach the threshold of tickets first will win the show, basically. So that's how that kind of money component works. Um, at the moment, it's still, like I said, it's an experiment. And it's still very curated by us. So like we're working very, very hands on with like promoters on the ground in these locations, um, with the management company, the, their booking agent, the artists themselves. All those people really need to be involved because we're trying to figure out how, how this works best. And, and I think in the future, the, the, our challenge is to figure out how to, how to kind of scale this a bit better so that more artists, like it can be more of a self-serve platform and more artists can kind of take advantage of, of using this. My, my second question is, is there any aid in location of a specific venue that might fit based upon the proposed amount of people who want to come? Uh, do you give any guidance in, in that, or is that totally for the booking agents and things of that nature? Yeah, right now we're, we're very much working with promoters that are on the ground in, in Latin America for Andrew Bird, stuff like that. So it's, it's um, yeah, it, it, it's, when it scales, it, it, that might not be as uh, as easy to do, but... It's, I think there will always be that kind of local component because you need someone with local knowledge. Like, they know their market there. Um, I know you guys are a UK-based company. You just mentioned Latin America. Are you truly global? Like, can we do stuff in Brazil? That's, that's where I need it. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody else is in London. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, um, holding down the fort in the U.S. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the really exciting things about Detour is, like, taking artists to new markets because, you know, with all this, like, online grouping of fans everywhere it's it's been really hard to to kind of like take advantage of that as um a music industry Absolutely. all right great well thank you so much and thanks to all of the presenters and uh reaction panelists <laughs>